Well, I am excited about the Word of God. I'm excited about being able to teach the Word of God again. And if you're visiting, we've been doing a series on the Holy Spirit. We're in week 13 or 14, I forget. It's been a while. Uh, And I I have no idea when it will end. Uh, We'll soon end the what the Holy Spirit produces in us with the fruit of the Spirit. We'll soon end with that in a couple of weeks. But there will be more added to this uh, and then I'll kind of close it out because anytime you get in a series, the Lord lays on your heart other things that you want to talk about. And I certainly want to talk uh, uh, in the future uh, about a lot of things that are going on in the world today, some prophetic things uh, about how everyone thinks they're a prophet. You know, the, 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 the blood moons and all this stuff has come and gone. And guess what? Jesus hadn't come back yet. And, and I, want to, I want to address some of the stuff, some of the foolishness that's being taught out there. No man knows the day and the hour when he's coming back. Amen. No one. And that's nothing but promo and advertisement to sell books and that kind of junk. I, I believe we should spend our time expositing the Word of God so that we learn how to build that foundation and trust Christ. You say, you don't believe he's coming back? I didn't say that at all. I believe he's coming back, but I don't believe anyone will know. And I believe his coming is very near. So uh, there's some things I want to talk about. I want to talk about the power of one. I want to talk about one in the Scripture. I want to talk about a lot of things after we get through with this. But until we get there, I, I want to I finish strong on the Holy Spirit. I really do. And the Holy Spirit is, we, we've learned so much. And this morning we're going to be talking about faith and faithfulness. They go together. It depends on what version you have on how it's interpreted in Galatians chapter number 5 as we're dealing with the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I have a clip this morning, and it's entitled, Lord, Lord. You say, what does that have to do with faith? Well, Jesus made this statement. He said, you call me Lord, Lord, but yet you do not do the things that I say. He said another time, you call me Lord, with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. He also says in the Gospel of John, if you love me, you will do the things that I say. And those things that we do, we encapsulate them with the word faithfulness or faith. And this clip is about how Jesus is dealing with someone who he's laid upon their heart, he's told them specifically what to do but yet they do not honor his word with faithfulness. When we put our life in Jesus' hand and we are directed by the Holy Spirit, then what the Holy Spirit does, he brings all things to our remembrance. He brings all the things uh, that Jesus tells us to do. He's God in us, and we grieve the Spirit by not following through faithfully with what the Holy Spirit has us to do. Or tells us to do and if we're not faithful we'll never please God because Hebrews eleven six says for without faith or the same word faithfulness it's impossible to please God when we get to Hebrews chapter 11 we talk about the great chapter of faith the very acts that they're mentioned by is their faithfulness because they're people of faith Watch the clip. I'll be back. Hopefully, I'll speak into your life about how to be more faithful by yielding yourself and your life to the Holy Spirit. It, it, it's, it's so simplistic. Some of you may say, well, I got that. It's not whether you got it or not. It's whether you will do it or not. Watch the clip, and I'll be back. The perfect time to talk about obedience. But really, defining the word obedience really means faithfulness. You can't be obedient if you're not going to be faithful. Amen? Because when we act on God's Word, what we're really doing is showing obedience. So take your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter number 5, and again, I'll give you the little precursor introduction. I've done it every week that we get there. In verse number 16 of chapter 5, it says, I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Okay? But you... But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, again, we, we haven't read the ones that pertain to what the flesh does because our emphasis is not on the flesh. We all live in the flesh. We do. We try to say we don't, but we do. Okay? We, we, we really do. You live in Romans 7 the same way that I and the Apostle Paul live in Romans 7. We don't do the things we want to do, and we do the things we don't want to do. And, and, and at the end of the day, when we examine our own soul, we really realize that we're like a wretched man. 
We really are. But thank God for grace. Amen. And we have victory in Christ Jesus. What we want to deal with is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, in verse 22, that's where it picks up. But the fruit of the Spirit, now, when we say fruit of the Spirit, it's something that the Holy Spirit produces. And the fruit of the Spirit is not necessarily for you. The fruit of the Spirit is to help you in your horizontal worship and witnessing because as the Holy Spirit comes in us, we have the power to be a witness for God. In Acts 1.8, it says, After the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be my what? Witnesses. That's the power, the Holy Spirit. We in and of ourselves have no power at all. We're void. We get the power of God upon our life and in our life when the Holy Spirit enters us as a believer. And we get that by faith. So the, fulfilling, uh, the fulfillment of the purpose of the Holy Spirit is for us to be witnesses. And for us to worship and to witness properly, we witness to God in a vertical way Then it's between me and God. Some people say, what I do in my worship is between me and God and me and God only. That's not true. We worship vertically and we worship horizontally. What we do affects other people. How we worship affects other people. How we live our life affects other people. Say amen whether you believe it or not. Amen. Because it, it's true. It's true. You say, well, I can't make a difference in the world. Every one of us has a world that we control. And in our own sphere, our own world, we can make a difference with the people that are watching us. It's incredible what God will do. So as we're dealing with this, there were nine elements in the fruit of the Spirit that he talked about. The first three deal with God. The second three that we've already uh, gone through, that's number one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, deal with manward, how we deal with man. Today we're starting on the section of the fruit of the Spirit that deals selfward. It deals with us. So the fruit of the Spirit allows us, check this out, to have balance in our life. It allows us to to be fulfilling and to receive the things of God and to honor God with love, joy, and peace. Those are the things that God provides. And it allows us to worship and to witness that these things are evident in our life and God gets all the glory. Amen? The second three that we look at, he says, he says you have love, joy, and peace. We have long-suffering, kindness, and goodness. And believe it or not, I got the most compliments on those messages than I did some of the deep theological things that we, we did. And here's why. They were so practical that they allowed us to learn how to act toward other people. Patient with people. Kind with people. Good to people. You know why? That's where we live. And when we're good to people, we fulfill what Jesus said. If you have love one for another, then the world will know that what? You are my disciples. And now God gets the glory. We're disciples of Jesus Christ. They see we're believers. When the term disciple is used, it's talking about us. And they see that we're witnesses now. We're disciples because of our patience with people, because of our, our kindness to people, because of our goodness that we show to people. And we all need to quit being jerks. Amen? Somehow we got stuck on that term. And it became relevant uh, when we weren't kind, when we weren't good, and we weren't patient. We just sometimes act like jerks, and that brings no glory to God. It's just us acting in the flesh. So we saw how it all was fitly joined together. We saw how it started to make real sense, how the Holy Spirit was doing a work in us. Now, the Holy Spirit uh, is not finished because we have the attributes that, that God has given us, and it, it brings glory to Him. We have our manwardness where we, where we share in our horizontal worship, and we witness for God. It brings Him glory. People come to Christ. They see that we're different. We don't act like the world. And then He says, but that's not enough. Here's the real balance. You've got to find something in and of your yourself you need to be filled with fruit in and of yourself so that you are whole so that you're not mechanical in what you do so he deals with the next three and he says this he says there's faithfulness gentleness and self-control if you want to be complete if you want to continue the cycle if you want to have balance in your life then you have to have these three elements in your life and it starts with faith or faithfulness and you say why are you saying both well, you may have a version that says, and there'll be faith. And you might have a version that says, there's faithfulness. And why does it say this? Because the same Greek word as the word pistis is used for both words. It's used for both words. It is the manifestation uh, of, of the fruit of the Spirit that pertains to loyalty and trustworthiness. When we have faith in God, 
It pertains to his loyalty and his trustworthiness. When we have faith in God, we're trusting in God. When someone comes to Christ, we ask them to what? Trust in Christ. And let me ask you this. Is he trustworthy? Absolutely he is. And we find that, so it pertains to that. And in our faithfulness, the same word pistis means loyalty and trustworthiness. And I'm going to deal with both as we move through it. Jeremiah declared that the Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, for his compassions never fail, and they are new every morning. And then he says this, great is thy faithfulness. Lamentations 3.22. God is always faithful. He is always faithful because Jesus was faithful. The scripture says about him in Philippians 2, 7 and 9 that he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And because of the son's faithfulness, the father highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. And it goes on and says, and every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Why? Because of his trustworthiness and his faithfulness. God is faithful. <clears throat> the servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God are to be like the Lord in being found trustworthy, 1 Corinthians 4.12. The Scripture says, Moreover, it's required of a steward that a man be found faithful. The same word, that we, may, we, we, we remain loyal and that we remain trustworthy in, in our following of God. Now, I could get deeper and I could, I could really break the thing down in a theological precept. I, I, could, I could give you the Southwest Seminary version of faith. I could give you uh, Westminster Abbey's uh, uh, definition of faith. I could give you the Oxford definition of faith. But I'd rather give you the biblical uh, definition of faith and how it is achieved. Because in this, we are called people of faith. Matter of fact, when you run across someone, you'll ask them this question sometimes, or I hope that you do if you're a proper witness. What's your faith? What, what, what faith are you? When you fill out a form, it'll ask this question. What faith are you? Are you Protestant? Are you Catholic? Are you Muslim? Are you this? Are you that? They want to know what faith because what they're really saying is what do you honor? What do you believe? What is the essence of who you are? Okay? Because the true essence of who we are and the true essence of faith is exhibited in faithfulness. If you are not a faithful individual, I would check up on what kind of faith that I had. Because here's what happens. Your orthodoxy, that is what you believe, drives what you practice. Your orthoproxy. In other words, if you don't know what you believe, then you certainly don't know what to practice. Amen? And if you believe every kind of junk that's out there, your, your practice is going to be junk too. But if you don't really believe anything, then you're really not going to do anything. Stay with me now. It gets better. It doesn't get hard. You can say amen. You can say he's helping me today. Everybody say he's helping me today. Okay? Because, again, we're dealing with what the Holy Spirit produces in us. And we struggle. You're in a natural response when you struggle with the fruit of the Spirit. It is natural because you still have flesh. Amen? But now you have the Spirit. Prior to the Spirit, you had no struggle. Lost people don't struggle like we struggle. But lost people are not going to heaven like we are. Lost people don't have God as a father like we do. You say, well, I thought he was the father of everyone. No, 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 no. He doesn't become father until you're adopted in the family of God by faith. He said, well, I thought God was the father of everyone. That means everyone's saved if God's the father of everyone. See, they don't have the privilege of calling him father until they come to Christ by faith in what the father has done for us. He's known as God. He's known as God. But God takes on a new dimension for the believer that comes to God by faith. He's no longer God. He's father. Because we've been adopted into the family of God. And if you can't say that naturally, I would check on, again, my faith, because to a, to a person of faith, then knowing the Father or knowing God should be that we cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, God. It is a relationship and not a religious standing. Amen? Are you still with me now? Say amen. Now, that is as deep as I'm going to go. 
But man, it grieves my heart sometimes because I really like to get into deep stuff. But the simplicity of faith, I think, sometimes is what we need to look at. Now, we're called people of faith, a people of substance. Now, let me just talk again about the Holy Spirit. Now, now, now just stay with me because it's going to move very quickly. You are here today because of the work of the Holy Spirit. You are here today because of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the vessel that draws you to God. It is the Holy Spirit that opens the heart to the soul. He brings conviction. He brings enlightenment to the Word of God. So let's give credit where credit is due. You are here today because of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You say, well, I'm, I'm not a believer. You're still here today because of the Holy Spirit. Drawing you to God. That's the first act and responsibility of the Holy Spirit is to draw us to God. If you're a lost person, his work is to bring you to Christ. If you're a believer, his work brought you to the new birth. Again, let me say that again. If you're a lost person, his work is to bring you to Christ. If you're here today, the Holy Spirit brought you here, and the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to bring you to Christ. It's not about you. It's about the Holy Spirit drawing you to Christ. And if you are a believer, now think about this. If you are a believer, his work brought you to your new birth. So the Holy Spirit should certainly be worshipped. And if you're a believer that's been brought here, but yet a backslider. Now, let me define the, or kind of e exemplify the term backslider. That's someone who's been saved, been born again, that's known a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and somewhere along the way, the flesh became so dominant in their life, they grieved the Holy Spirit instead of walking with God. Now, they're no longer walking with God, and they backslid into the state that their flesh is what consumes them instead of the leading of the Spirit. Now, do you understand what I'm saying when I'm talking about a backslider? You've been redeemed, you're born again, but you're backslidden, you're relationship with God. If you understand that, say amen. amen. And let me just ask this question. How many of you, and you say this is pretty bold, how many of you have ever been backslidden? All right, put your hand down. I don't really like the term. Uh, the, you know what the better term is? Disobedient. Disobedient. We, we try to make it look at, well, I just backslid like I slipped on something and it kind of just drove me back. No, I got in that state because I did not obey what the Holy Spirit told me to do. Amen? And we said, well, we, we just backslid. They just a little backslidden, and, and like they hit some grease or some oil or something, and it kind of just made them slide back. No, we backslid because of our sin, because of our disobedience, and because of our, our nonconforming attitude to the Holy Spirit that lives in us. Now, again, that's what the Holy Spirit does. If you're a backslider, His work is to restore you. For the lost, for the redeemed, for the backslider, the Holy Spirit is constantly at work. Isn't that good? God never gives up on you if you're backslidden today. You haven't gone too far. You haven't crossed the line. There is no line. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. The Holy Spirit abides in you. We've learned how long? Forever for the true believer. And you will be in conviction if you're backslidden. In my backslidden state, I have been the most miserable spiritually that I've ever been. And boy, it's wonderful when we're restored. The Holy Spirit's job for a backslidden believer is to restore you today. The believer's body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. His presence is with, uh, within is revealed by the fruit of the Spirit that he produces. You will know that you're a believer in Christ if these evidences of fruit are, are there in your life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, our patience, kindness, goodness, and today faithfulness or faith, the element of faith that produces faithfulness, okay? So, with saying all of that, let me give you three things. Just three. Somebody should say amen to that. When I started out younger, uh, in younger days when my hair was jet black, I used to do a seven-point outline. Some of you say, oh, my God. Uh, yeah, if you, if you were doing a text, you would certainly use that little symbol, that, that, that little, uh, uh, anyway, you would do it. Seven-point outline, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Be glad it's three. God is good. And all the time? Good. You learned that last week, right? Write this down. Let's talk about faith because it says the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. And it comes from the same word, the Greek word pistis, where we get faith, okay? Now, when we talk about faith and we talk about faithfulness, they're in the same, they're encapsulated the same way in Scripture. And, and I told you I could give you many definitions, but I'd rather use the biblical definition and I'd rather use the point of view that Jesus had. If Jesus is the one that we look toward, 
who is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but by him, I want to know everything that Jesus has to say how to come into the kingdom of God. What about you? I'd rather listen to Jesus than any television preacher out there. I'd rather listen to Jesus than hear me. And by the way, I don't listen to what I do. I say, oh me, I'm afraid to listen to it. I am absolutely afraid to listen to it sometimes. So I don't, I don't go back and listen to what I do. I don't, I don't speak to hear myself speak. I just hope the Holy Spirit reveals it and brings it out the way it should come. Amen? Because if I, if I start listening too much to me, I'll start trying to craft it in the flesh. I'd rather be spirit-led than flesh-led. Amen? I'd rather not put my mind too much on what I need to say. I'd rather just say I'm going to be dependent on the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, does that mean I don't think about what I say? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means sometimes I think better than others so that I don't put my foot in my mouth. Amen? So, watch this. Here's Jesus' point of view. Matthew 18, 1 through 4. You don't need to turn there. You're going to see it on the screen. It says, at that time, the disciples. Everybody say the word disciples. Okay, these are people... In the Greek language, the word disciple, it's, it's, it, it's pronounced the word mathetes, and it simply means a learner, a learner, one who sets at one's feet, the disciples, the learners. Now, in this reference, he's talking about the disciples that he called, but the whole point of them being called was to learn about what they needed to turn the world upside down because he's going to go away, but he's preparing them as they're learning and it says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They've been dealing with the religious Pharisees, and they've been dealing with the law and a bunch of things, and they ask a legitimate question. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Who's going to be the greatest? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, he just calls a little child. Now, I have 10 grandkids. I am blessed. I have two more twin girls on the way. I am really going to be blessed. And those other 10 grandkids are going to be blessed as, they, that, that, as that dynamic duo comes on the scene in the next couple of months. I can imagine how many times they're going to want to be held by their cousins. I can imagine how many times those little, little girls are going to want to be held by their aunts and uncles. Sean said, he, he does not want any more kids. He's got two girls on the way. Amen? Those will be his nieces. He said, that'll be plenty for me. And they're going to they're gonna adore them, and they're going to nurture them, and they're going to do all of that. And let me just say this. Jesus loved children. And, and you know what? Kids will really tell you what they think. How many of you agree with that? They'll come up to you and say, Poppy, you're fat. Or, Poppy, you're old. Or, Poppy, you got a bald spot back there. Your hair is, is gone away. Did the barber cut it all out? They'll tell you stuff like that. How many have experienced that? They'll tell you, man. They'll tell you. They, they're just very simplistic. They don't understand, uh, especially little boys, they don't understand that the bathroom inside was made to go inside. When they got to go, they're whizzing. Amen? They're just very simple. They'll find a tree. They'll do what they do. Give me an Amen. You know what I'm talking about. They're simplistic. They don't have to have a big, deep understanding. And Jesus says, when they ask him the question, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, he says this. He brings a little child, and he sets them in the midst of the learners and all the religious crowd. He puts the little one right in the middle because he knows that the little ones get it. The little ones get it. I asked Ray this morning. I was kind of messing with him. He didn't know why. You don't, you, now you understand why I was asking you, don't you? And, and I was asked Ray, I said, explain to me, Ray, how a person gets into the kingdom. And he says, well, sir, um, uh, I, I believe that one confesses with the mouth, believes in the heart, and they, they trust totally in the Holy Spirit. And he went through this dissertation, and, and it was perfect. It was good. It was deep. It was, and, and then he said, you know, and the response to that will be this, 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 and this. And I said, well, yeah, I, I got it. I got it. I got it. You, you're doing real good, Ray. You got, you, you got it. It would have been a great textbook answer for those who needed a big answer. But Jesus said it this way. He puts a little kid in the middle, and you ask a little kid. You ask, you ask any little kid in our children's department, how do you know you're saved? And you know what they'll tell you? Because Jesus is in my heart. Well, how do you know? Well, my teacher said. Well, what did she read to you? The Bible. How do you know Jesus is in your heart? Because the Bible says he can come into my heart if I call on the name of the Lord. Very simplistic, very easy to understand. 
See, God did not want to exclude anyone when it came to this thing called faith. And he wants us to understand that faith leads to faithfulness. And little kids, this is an amazing thing. We drop Jackson off occasionally when he spends the night at the house. He blew me away a few weeks ago. I hadn't taken him to school at all this year. And I drive, I'm, I'm in line, Katie uh, couldn't find the keys, and I, I said, no problem, I'll run over, I'll pick him up, I was up, everything was great, and I love taking him to school. You know, you, you go around the line, and me and him are just conversing, we're talking, we're doing all of this stuff, and we're just having our good little morning drive to the school. And the first time I'd ever done it, uh, this year. And I, I know the routine, I get in the line, and out of nowhere... I'm driving, and he says, okay, Poppy. He, he, he unbuckles his seat. He reaches his little hand forward, and he takes my hand. He said, give me your hand. And I thought, what are you doing? He said, it's time to pray. And, man, he starts praying, and the portals of heaven opened up. He says, dear Lord, I pray that I'll have a good day today and that I'll stay on purple. Purple's the highest He's never missed purple in two years. It's not just green, it's purple. Dear Lord, I pray that I'll stay there, and I pray for my teacher. And then he said, I pray for my mommy and daddy, and I pray for my poppy. Man, you talking about faith that took a leap because of a little one's faithfulness. Say, where did he learn that? Well, he learned it from his mommy and daddy. But he also learned it from the Holy Spirit that he can trust God. And that he can depend on God. And that he takes his petitions before the Lord. And Jesus said, that's how you have to be. You have to have childlike faith. Look what he says. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, just believe my word. You will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And some try to make faith complicated. Faith is simply believing God will do what he said he will do. Faith is simply believing that God loves you. The flesh says God can't love you because the flesh knows how the flesh acts. And the enemy wants you to disbelieve that God loves you, that God cares about you. But the word of God says, faith says, God loves you. And you've got to have a childlike faith to say, I understand that. Jesus illustrated faith with a little child. The little child compared to the religious is incredible. Some people say, that's too simple. That's too simple. Why in the world is it too simple to believe that God is able to do what he said he will do? Why is it too, too simple to believe that God is faithful to do all that he said he would do? Because if we examine the scripture, we will find everything that God said always happened. We will find the promises of God that are always, yes, the Scripture says, that God is faithful to, to be trustworthy in every promise that he ever made except one, and that is what, church? That he cannot lie. And faith says we trust that. Childlike faith says we trust it. The little child compared to the disciples, they were pondering that it's got to be something deeper to be great in the kingdom. He said, no, to be great in the kingdom is to humble yourself and just believe what I told you to do. That's an important thing. He compared, Jesus made the deep things easy to understand. He compared uh, uh, familiar things to spiritual things. He said the kingdom of God is like a farmer who's putting seed in the ground. You don't put seed in the ground, you don't reap a crop, right? You, you, whatever a man sows, he what? He reaps. You sow bountifully, you what? You reap bountifully. You don't sow much, you don't get much. It's, more, it's, it's better to give than to receive. And he said if you'll put me to the test, you'll get good measure. Press down. Running over so much that you cannot receive it. He tells us all through. He makes it very easy. He talks about uh, things that are spiritual in familiar terms. A little child simply believes. Many people say, I can't serve God in, in some capacity in the church. Every one of you have the ability to work with little children. It's not that you can't. It's that you won't. 
And Jesus said that kind of faith is the greatest kind of faith. If you talk to the people that work in the children's department, Joe and Mike and Jennifer and all of those guys and, and, and Matt and his wife, all of those that work with those children, they will tell you they are so rewarded. Jim and Brenda, they are so rewarded because they give these little kids a great foundation and, 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 and it's crazy. And then in a few years, you're going to see them like Ernie's boy. You're going to see them like Brian and Tess and others, Cameron and Cody and those guys. When they were little, they've been ministered to in the children's department, and now they're in high school and college and career, and they're becoming leaders of the church. And you'll look back and say, man, and, and let me just say this. If you work over there, when you see those kids like that, that's your fruit. That is your fruit. Your basket will be full as you were led by the Spirit to be faithful. And, and see, he, he, he taught about and compared uh, familiar things with spiritual, and a little child simply believes. And see, here's the deal. Most people don't say it this way. They say it this way. God said it, and I believe it, and that settles it. But that's not the right way. God said it, and whether you believe it or not, that settles it. Amen? Even in saying that God said it and I believe it, what about the part God said that you don't believe? Because let's don't say we do everything and believe everything that God said because if we did believe it, we would what? Everybody say that real loud. Somebody say it louder. You would do what? Do it. You would do it. We say we believe. You know, let me, let me let you in on a little secret. Here's a little secret. I don't know if you know this. The devil believes and trembles, but he doesn't obey and he certainly doesn't have a relationship with a living God. Amen. But he believes. But the object of his belief and his, his, his faith is not based on the trustworthiness of God. It's based on what he wants us to produce. And that's the, the, the ways of the world and what the flesh produces. He's the prince and power of the air. Whatever God's for, he's against. But he believes. See, it's settled whether you believe it or not. The issue is, will you obey? Will you have faith enough or faithfulness to obey what God said? Faith that cuts through religious ceremony and beliefs. That's childlike faith. You don't need a deep explanation for some of this stuff. You need to say, that's what God's Word says, and the Spirit has revealed that to me, and I don't need any more than what the Word says. Amen? You say, well, that's so simplistic. And, and you know, people have tried to make salvation so hard. You know, there are two camps for salvation. You say, well, there's all kind of, there, there's, there's, there's Pentecostals, there's Assembly of God, there's Charismatics, there's Catholic, there's, there's Mormons, and there's, there's, there's Baptists, and there's Free Will Baptists, and there's Fundamental Baptists, and there's, there's, I mean, the Baptists got a whole line of stuff to go along with them. I mean, we, there's a whole bunch of stuff. And there's Church of Christ, and there's this, and you got all of these camps, and there's this and that. There are only two camps. The whosoever wills and the whosoever wants. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord and those who won't. Those are the two camps. There's going to be, of all of those numbers that I named, there's going to be some of those folks in heaven. You say, how do you know that? Because the Bible says in heaven, there was, every nation is represented in worshiping God in heaven. But there's two camps, the whosoever wills and the whosoever wants. And people have tried to make salvation an academic thing. Salvation is not an academic thing. Salvation is believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ died for your sins. And that God loves you and he sent his son to die for you. I mean, it's all through the scripture. How much, how much, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Thank God. If that were the only verse, it'd be verse enough. Amen. But man, there's so many other verses. A childlike faith. Faith that places no limits on the power and the love of God. You say, Pastor Mike, God can't love me. I'm, I'm, I'm just so bad. You don't understand what I have done. My life is a wreck. You know what? If you say that today, you know what? You are the number one candidate that the Holy Spirit will come after and draw. If you say that I am the worst, you're right where you need to be where God can use you. He loves taking the worst and making them the best. Amen? He does. He loves you. But see, the flesh will say, you're too bad. 
Look at all that you've done. Well, yeah, you can look at all that you've done, but you better also take another look of all that God has done. Amen? And the greatest work that God ever did is when he sent his son to die for us. So, faith that is childlike. Let me give you the second thing. Write it down. Faith that rises to all the challenges of life. Now, this takes me to one of the great chapters in the Bible, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11. Faith that rises to all the challenges of life. Now, here's the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the fruit of the Spirit, and again, we're talking not Godward, not manward, we're talking selfward. I don't know where I would be without faith. Amen? I need faith to live in this life. I am a person of faith. Every time I see God do something else, my faith grows. Jesus is the author and the finisher of my what? Faith. Okay? He is the one orchestrating what happens in my life. The Holy Spirit is here to guide me and for me to, to realize that God is orchestrating something in my life. Difficult things? Yes. Do believers have difficult things in their life? All the time. Jesus said, you have tribulation. You will be faced with trials and difficulties. But fear not. Be anxious for nothing. He said all of those things. The Holy Spirit is in you. That's why we can fear not. His promise, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, is there. He's going to guide us to truth. He's going to do all those things. But faith that rises to all the challenges of life. Now, here's the definition the Bible gives. I gave you how Jesus said it's got to have childlike faith. But if you want a spiritual definition, it's, right, it's found right here in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, faith, by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. In other words, when they started to trust God by faith, what faith did was produce a lifestyle and a good testimony that was related to faithfulness. They would have not had a good lifestyle. They would have not had a good testimony if they had not been faithful. And you can only be faithful if you have come to God by faith. Now, let me break it down a little bit more. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. In other words, faith is not some pipe dream that you just run and jump off a cliff and hope that you'll be okay. Faith has substance. It has a reality to it that you can put your hands on. You can put your mind on. You can put your heart on. It has substance. It's something that is real. It's tangible. It's something that, that you can wrap your arms around and say, man, that's good. That's what faith, it's substance. And then it says it's the substance of things hoped for. I can hope that I have eternal life. And it becomes so real to me that I know I have eternal life because it is, it's existent in my life. It, it ministers to me. It gives me assurance. I know it's there. It has substance. And then it says, look what it says. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I, in other words, there's proof. I'm hoping for it, and there's proof. You know how that proof is seen? Through the fruit of the Spirit. Through the fruit of the Spirit, folks, the Holy Spirit living in us, we have evidence of the faithfulness of God as we come to God by faith, and then what we start to do is to have faithfulness in our life, and it produces the evidence and substance of faith so that people know we have a good testimony. How many people that do you know that say they're a Christian, but they have a sorry testimony? Say amen. Y'all, so All of you are nodding your head. Now, if the question was asked or the statement was made about you, would people say you have a good testimony or a marginal testimony or a bad testimony? We won't go there. But in reality, as we struggle with the spirit and the flesh, and as we war against those two, we should ask ourselves the question, what is my testimony? The horizontal worship, the horizontal witness that we have of God. Are we being faithful? Do people see God in us? Because if we're not faithful, they're not going to see God in us. They're going to see the flesh. And I'm not, I'm not being ugly. I'm being helpful this morning. So here's, here's the thing. And it says the elders obtained a good testimony. Okay? Faith is built on the conviction that God can do anything. It's based on that conviction. There's substance. The Bible says that all things are possible with God. 
There's nothing that God cannot do. He created all. There's nothing that was made that was not made by him. He's the creator of it all. And see, what happens is we need to keep God in the proper perspective. He is a sovereign God in absolute control of everything that goes on. And he's created man, and he said it was good, and he made us in his image, and we have the freedom to choose. We can be obedient or disobedient. Amen? If you're disobedient today, you have the freedom of choice. If you're obedient today, you have the freedom of choice. We, we are people uh, that have the ability to choose. When Jesus wept over Jerusalem, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would that you would come, but you would not. Not that you could not, but that you would not. And he said, If you had come, I would have gathered you as a, a mother hen gathers her chicks, and I would have put you under my wings, and I would have fed and nurtured you. But you would not come. You had a choice, and you would not. We are people of choice. We can be obedient, or we can be disobedient. But faith that rises to the challenge of life is what the Holy Spirit produced. And, and see, if you go down to Hebrews 4, I, I could spend a month on this thing, okay? Because it says in verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that the things which are, uh, that are seen were not made of things that are visible. In other words, he said, we know God made it. We don't know exactly how he did all the things he did, but the Scripture says he spoke it into existence, and that's all we need to know. He spoke it into existence, and that's, that should be good enough for us. God is the one behind it. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. But see, the flesh says, well, I've got to have more than that. I just don't know if I can cling my theological mind to that. Well, you and your theological mind, that's good. But I'd rather have your theological heart because it's with the heart man believes and confesses with his mouth, not his mind. you just got to renew that mind and understand God is in charge of it all. Amen? It's really good because, see, verse 4, look what he says. He starts giving examples of, and it uses the word faith, but what it really translates is faithfulness. By faithfulness, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, faithfulness, or the faith that he had by trusting God, uh, it said he being uh, still dead speaks. In other words, we know Cain slew Abel because Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. He trusted God, and 2,000 years later, his testimony is still speaking that he trusted God. He obtained a greater testimony that God is faithful. The Scripture wrote it down that he trusted God and that he was faithful. Faithfulness matters, right? We find it, it's on that conviction. Faith allowed Enoch to walk with God. Hebrews 5, look what it says. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this what? Testimony. This testimony that he pleased God. He was faithful. He was so faithful. He was walking with God one day, and God said, I like this so much, I'm not putting you back there. You just come on up here and walk with me every day. By faith, he obtained a what? A good testimony testimony by his faithfulness walking with God faith allowed Abel to worship God faith allowed Enoch to walk with God or their faithfulness now this morning if your worship needs to be right you've got to be faithful if you want to walk with God you've got to be faithful and faithfulness means you've got to be obedient they go together by faith Noah I mean if you read it look at verse 7 this is wonderful by faith Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen Faith is now the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Noah saw. You know what? In Noah's day, Noah had never seen it rain. And God said, it's going to rain. And Noah said, what's rain? And I don't know if God explained to Noah what would happen, but you say, how was the earth furnished? There was a ferment around the earth, and it nurtured. They'd never seen it rain. They'd never seen the, 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 the mountains burst open, and the seas open up, and the flood come. And God told Noah, and Noah believed it so much, for 120 years, he was out building a boat nowhere even close to water. And he didn't know about rain, but he believed God. So we find that that faith allowed Noah to work for God. We find faith allowed Abraham to obey God. Hebrews 11.8 said he left, he was rich, he was prosperous, and God said, get out of that country, go to here. He was in Ur of the Chaldees. He went there, and, and, and then he was to a place of Harwin. He said, get out of the place of your father. And in other words, when Abraham moved, he left where he was, went to his father's place, and God said, that's not good enough. I want you to go to a far country because I'm going to do a work in you. It allowed Abraham to forsake all and follow Jesus as the model was given, as he was told to follow me. And we're given the same commandment in the New Testament, follow me, follow me. 
Faith has substance in many tough times. Many of you can give me experiences in your life where it looked bleak, but by faith God came through. And by your faithfulness you never wavered. Faith removes all limits on God's ability to provide faith, faithfulness. Let me just say this. If you're a faithful person, you need not worry about the things of life. Did you hear what I said? Let me say it again so you get it. If you are a faithful person, you need not worry about the things of this life. God will honor you. His word said that he will. You won't miss meals. You won't go without a roof over your head. If you are a faithful person, you will, you will fall under the blessing of God. You will. It doesn't mean you won't have tribulation. It won't mean you have struggle. Have struggle, but God will be doing something in your life because of your faithfulness. Why? To make you even more faithful. Even to make you stronger. Faith removes all limits on God's ability to provide. Faith claims the resources of God in every crisis. Have you ever been to the place that you just have nowhere to turn except but to God? Be honest. Health issue, tumor, diagnosis of cancer. Maybe you lost your husband. Maybe you lost your wife. You thought the world was coming to an end. You, maybe your kids were so wayward that, that you felt so hopeless. And all you began to do was pray and seek God's face. And you know what? You're here today. And the sun will still shine. And God is still on the throne. And the world is not as bad as you think. And God is always faithful and he comes through. Amen. That's what faith does in faithfulness. It claims the resources of God in every crisis. Heroic faith is the fruit of the Spirit. Let me say that again. Heroic faith is the fruit of the Spirit. Not fleshly faith, but heroic faith is the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come in and demand and reveal to us that we should be faithful. And when we yield ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit, then we no longer struggle. Then we no longer have the strife that goes on within us. We're being led by the Spirit. Because if you can believe, all things are possible, Mark 9, 23 says. The problem is the Holy Spirit will reveal it to us and we'll say, I don't believe it. Or we'll say the real spiritual one, I believe it, but help my unbelief. Right? But go back to the example again of a child. You tell a child, and they don't go into a bunch of deep theological questions. They ask simplistic questions. Why? Because they believe God is able. They believe their little prayers that God is able. I don't care if they're praying for their dog or praying for a test or praying for their teacher or praying for their poppy or their mommy. They believe God is able. And many of us won't pray because in reality, we don't believe God is able or that God loves us enough to do it. But faithfulness, the fruit of the Spirit produced, is produced to help, worth, to help us inwardly so that we can have the balance of life that we need to be the witnesses we need to be for God. So faith that rises to the challenges of life is what we're talking about here, the fruit of the Spirit. There's one more. Stay with me. One more. It's going to move real quick, okay? The reason I know is I only have one little page for it. It's important. Here's the third thing. Write it down. Faith that proves the believer's life is different. Now, at some point in your Christian walk, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say it bold, and some of you might get upset over it, but at some point, you've got to put up or shut up. Can I get an amen? I normally get those amens from the ones who have put up. So they don't have to shut up. So they say amen. Because they've been faithful and they have put God to the test and they understand that he is loyal and trustworthy and they can say amen to that because they understand there's real substance to the Christian life and there's real substance to be a redeemed, born-again believer. It's not just that God is doing an improvement on us. It's that God has made us anew. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, now all things have become new. So faith that proves the believer's life is different. James 2.18, I got to say it. I got to use it. I have to. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. And then he goes on and says in the same dialogue, if you have faith without works... Your faith is dead. It's non-existent. In other words, if you say you have faith, but you are not faithful because works are faithfulness, right? 
works are the acts that we do that come from our faith. And when we start to do them, we call it faithfulness. So when we have works, we are faithful. And that's what the Holy Spirit produces, and, uh, produces in us. And by the way, your good works have been ordained before the foundation of the world that you should abide in the good works. God has already got a good work planned for you. The problem is we don't receive it. We don't do it. We do what the flesh wants. We do what we want. Remember the little, little deal? God told her, I want you to forgive Cat. And she said, well, that's too hard, God. Go to Cat, tell her to come to me and forgive me. No, God said, I don't want it that way. The problem is we, we just don't want to do what God says, so thus we're not faithful and our good works are never manifested. Okay, when we are faithful, our works are no longer works. They're called good works. Good works, right? And we talked about last week about goodness. You'll see how it ties together. Faith in the deepest and broadest sense is when we are, are being faithful and obeying God's word and we're working for him. It's just not that we're servants and he's the master. It's, 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 it becomes our character in what we do. We are faithful. That's what the scripture says. Moreover, it's required of a man that he be found faithful. Matter of fact, the scripture says, if you remain faithful in this life, you'll receive the crown of life. Faithful. God rewards faithfulness. He rewards faithfulness. It's important. And it can be translated to loyalty and trustworthiness. Are you faithful? Can God look at you and say you're loyal and trustworthy to his cause? Whew, that's hard. That's hard. Because if you read Hebrews 11.10 and, and, and goes into chapter 12, it says, now check this out. Matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and use it. In, in Hebrews 12. Therefore, chapter 12. Okay? You might go back to where you, where you had Hebrews 11. Therefore, whenever you see a wherefore, therefore, you go back and you take into account the context of what was just stated. The context was chapter 11, faithfulness, 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 faithfulness. I mean, it goes on. It goes on 38 different times, talks about faithfulness. They were faithful. They were faithful. They did this. They did that. They were faithful. They were put in dungeons. They were faithful. They were given up to lions. They were faithful. There were perils. They were in storms. They were faithful. They did all this. They were what? They were faithful. They were faithful. You go back and you look at Hebrews chapter 11, and they were all faithful, and they're what we call the, the hall of fame of faith. Well, it's really the hall of fame of faithfulness. And in chapter 12, it says this, Therefore... Because they were faithful, we are encompassed. Check this out. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, lay us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run the race with endurance that is set before us. In other words, let us be faithful like chapter 11 was faithful so that we can run the race of God with endurance by being faithful. Because if you're not faithful, if you quit, you'll never finish the race. You'll never finish what God has planned and provided for you to bless you with. It, I mean, it's trustworthiness and loyalness. How does God deem you when he looks at your life? The Holy Spirit produces faith and faithfulness. Are we grieving the Spirit or are we obeying God? It's as simple as that. This is the carry-through dimension to faith. You get faith to serve God. You don't get faith... You don't get faith just because you're a good person. The purpose of your faith is to exalt the King of kings and Lord of lords. The purpose of your faith is to worship and glorify God. The purpose of your faith is to be a worker in the kingdom for the king, for the Lord. That's why the little clip, why do you call me Lord? You're not doing what I say. See, the title of Lord is a title given to those who obey someone who is over. And here's what the flesh says. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to obey anybody. You're your own man and your own woman. But Jesus said, if you humble yourself with childlike faith, you'll be great in the kingdom of God. We need to understand that God is in control, and we need to be loyal and trustworthy. We need to be faithful as the Holy Spirit produces this in us so that we're able to exemplify those other six qualities, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, goodness, all of those things. And then we get to this. Why? Because we've been faithful. Because we're people of faith. We see God working. This is the carry-through dimension to faith. Faith produces visible evidence of faithfulness, faithful to Christ, faithful to His Word, faithful to His work in church, faithful to the use and talents and gifts, faithful in the use of material resources, 
Faithfulness. If you described your faith today, let me close with this. You can bring the lights down, Bruce. Man, I hope I didn't bore you with this. And, and, and look, it's the most important thing that we can ever talk about is our faith. And we don't know enough about our faith. Because if we knew more about our faith, we would be more faithful. Amen? Amen? And I can labor week after week after how we're to be witnesses and how we're to share Christ and how we're to get someone to come to hear God's Word. And, and it just goes on deaf ears sometimes. And, and it's very disheartening and disillusioning. So today I'm going to try a different approach. I'm going to ask this question. Describe your faith. Is it childlike? Do you believe that with our God all things are possible? Do you believe that God loves you so much that you don't have to fully understand every concept of it? You just need to believe it in your heart and trust His Word. His Word says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and that whosoever believes in Him, every sinner, every drug addict, every murderer, every rebellious person, every depraved man, that whosoever believes in him by faith, that God is trustworthy, that God is faithful, will not die, but he'll have everlasting life. Why? By, by trusting, by having faith in what God said he would do. Is your faith childlike? Do you believe God is able to accomplish all things, forgive all things, to do all things? Or is your faith, is it sufficient for life's challenges? You say, I know I'm a, redeem, I'm a redeemed believer, but I just struggle so much in this life. You don't have to struggle. You don't have to walk around in bondage. And so many of you are walking around in bondage. You say, I know God loved me and I know I'm a Christian, but I just can't shake this thing, this habit, or, or this baggage that I'm carrying. Yes, you can. Simply trust God. Trust the Holy Spirit here this morning. Come and confess that I forget those things that are behind and I press forward to the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Or is your faith such that it has changed your life? Or is your faith such that you've never had faith and your life has never been changed? Your faith is at that starting place. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you are, but I do know this. God has spoken to every person in this place. I want you to bow your heads right now. And by faith, I want you to listen to me. I want everyone to bow their head. I don't want to grieve the Spirit in any way. This is between every individual in this place and the Holy Spirit. Because remember, I said if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit brought you to this place. If you're a believer... That's outside the will of God and it's backslidden. That's the Holy Spirit's purpose right now to restore you. The Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart right now. And if you're lost, it's the Holy Spirit's purpose to bring you to Christ. To draw you to Christ. He's speaking to your heart. Now let me speak to this group first. This group first. And I want you to be honest. And I want you to let the Spirit lead you. I want you to humble yourself. As a little child, we're talking about childlike faith. If you're a person here today... That knows, let me clarify that, that knows they've never been born again. There's never been a change in their life. There's never been a transformation. And Jesus has never come into their heart by faith. And the Holy Spirit has revealed that to them this morning. Again, I'm talking to people who don't know Christ. And today, you want to receive Christ. You want to trust Christ by faith. I want you to slip up your hand. Every head is bowed and every eye closed. Is there anyone like that? I see that one, two hands. God bless you right in the middle. God bless you. The Holy Spirit has revealed to them that they need Christ this morning. They came lost. He's drawn them to Christ. He said, all who come to me, I'll never turn away. You can put your hands down. God bless you. Is there another? There's been two. Is there another? Put it up. Put your hand up, sweetheart. Anybody else? Put it up right now. If you're lost, you don't know Christ, raise your hand. 
the Holy Spirit is drawing you to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is doing a work in your heart right now. He's opened your heart. He's looking at your soul. And you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you died today, you'd not go to heaven because you never received Christ. Anyone else like that? We've had two. We've had two. Last opportunity. I'm, I'm going to have to move on. I don't want to close it. Anyone else? Your heart is pounding. Your hands are sweating. You say, I'll be embarrassed. Man, I'd rather be embarrassed and be lost. Amen. Somebody else, raise your hand. The Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart. Anybody else? These two people right here, would you raise your hand again where I could see you? No, everyone else, keep your head bowed. I don't want anybody else. Just raise your hand. God bless you. Is there another? Those right there. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Ray, I want you to come right here. Sean, I want you to come right over here. These, these, these two folks right here in the middle. These two individuals are going to come help you and, and reaffirm to you that God loves you and Jesus died for your sins. You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Why don't you guys just pray with them? Find your quiet spot. Two men, two grown, I'm talking about grown men, the Holy Spirit is drawn to a saving knowledge and love of Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit loves them this morning. Amen. Give them a hand clap right now. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let me just say this, fellas. We are happy for you. You are the reason the Holy Spirit brought you to this place this morning so that you could receive the love of God. Now, here, believers, you're not getting off the hook. Maybe you're backslidden in this place this morning. And we're not questioning your salvation at all. Maybe you've gotten out of fellowship with God. Maybe the flesh has been so overpowering. Maybe the, the issues in this life have been so overpowering. Maybe you've become so busy that you have found no time for God and you've looked up and you realize, I'm no longer in a good relationship with God. He loves me, but I am so far from Him, I don't even talk to Him anymore. I am backslidden. The Holy Spirit will restore you today. Is there anyone like that? Now, see, it takes a lot of courage for this, but it's about humbling oneself as a little child. Will you, will you be bold enough to say, I'm away from God, but I want to come back to God today. I know I'm redeemed. I know He died for me. I've trusted that. But I want my relationship to be like it once was. Anybody like that, I want to pray for you. Just slip up your hand. I'm not going to have somebody come pray with you. I'm going to pray for you right here. Slip up your hand. My hand's up. I see a hand in the back. I see hands right here. Hands over here. Hands right here. I want, I want the Holy Spirit will restore us this morning. And it doesn't take much to backslide, folks. It doesn't take much. It doesn't. We're all guilty. The difference is I'm going to be forgiven this morning because with childlike faith, I'm going to trust 1 John 1, 9. If I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from everything bad that I've done. And I'm going to, with childlike faith, say that after I confess it, he is thrown my sin as far as the east is from the west and he'll not remember it no more and I won't carry that baggage around. I'm going to confess it this morning and I'm going to leave here free because that Holy Spirit will restore me in a right relationship with God. What about you? Put your hand up. I'm going to pray for you. Anybody like that? Hands all over the house. I'm going to pray for you right now. Right now. Heavenly Father, have your way with all of us who have humbled ourselves and say, Lord, we're not where we want to be. We're not where we need to be. But we are confessing this morning our sin, our failures, our frailties, all of our issues of life. We are confessing them before the throne this morning. You are a reader of the heart. Even if we don't confess them, Lord, you know them anyway. But what you honor is the humbling of oneself with confession. So, Father, we all confess our frailty to you this morning. We all confess our lack of faithfulness. We all, Father, that raise their hand saying, Lord, do a work in me and restore me, Holy Spirit, back to where I need to be. And let me have that childlike faith that is produced by the Spirit that I can witness effectively for Christ. Father, we thank you. I'm going to forget those things. And I'm going to press forward for the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Lord, have your way in my life this morning. We thank you by receiving that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap offering here this morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Galatians 5. It's, it's one of those incredible passages of Scripture. He talked about faithfulness next week we're talking about gentleness and self-control how many of you want to hear about gentleness and self-control oh man be here next week the lord will bless you 
Amen. God has been good to us this morning. Two souls added to the kingdom of God. Amen. So let's stand, be dismissed with a word of prayer. You've been a wonderful group. Be here this week. Don't forget the trunk or treat. Don't forget the, the meal next week. See Sandy and Dee about tickets, whatever you need to do about that. There's a lot going on. Uh, don't, don't forget the kingdom dogs coming. See Big Dave about that. There's so much to do. Hug somebody's neck. God bless you. You're dismissed. Praise the Lord. Amen.